everyone. I'm Kathy Romero, and I'll be introducing our speaker this morning. Um, she was here a moment ago. <laughs> hey, <Still Jeff>. here. <laughs> there we go. Good morning and welcome to the 2021 GSAT virtual business meeting and conference. We hope you enjoy our presentations over the next two days. Please be sure that you are muted and the video is off. Questions will be taken at the end of presentation using the chat box only. It is my pleasure to honor and honor to present Ms. Joy Oria. And Joy's presentation will be about researching Mexican ancestry. Go ahead. All right, thank you, Kathy. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay, great, thanks. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, thank you to the Genealogical Society of Hispanic America for this opportunity. You know, researching Mexican ancestry is really an amazing experience because we have centuries of records to explore. You know, as family history researchers, we really benefit from the long history of excellent record keeping from the Catholic Church, the Spanish government, and the Mexican government. So my hope is, is that wherever you are in your research, whether you're just getting started or if you've been at this for a while, you'll learn some new things today that will help you out. So the topics that we'll be covering are research strategies. We'll cover some good practices to help you avoid mistakes and perform more effective research. We'll also talk about identifying place of origin. And before we can research in another country, we need to know which town our ancestor came from. Whether we're talking about Mexico, Germany, Ireland, or wherever, we need a town name, whether it's where your ancestor was born, where they got married, or maybe where they baptized a child. We need a town name. We'll take a look at the records. The Catholic Church provided us with many records, baptisms, marriages, burials, confirmations, rec uh, censuses. And then later, the Mexican government began civil registration records of births, marriages, deaths, and also censuses. So those are the two major record groups that we'll be covering but we'll take a look uh, at a few others. Translation tips. Whether you're fluent in Spanish or not, there's gonna be times going through these historical documents where you'll come across terms or phrases that you're not familiar with. And when you try Google Translate, it doesn't make any sense. So we'll learn some resources and solutions for those times. And lastly, we'll talk about online research, how to most effectively use family search and ancestry the two behemoths of online genealogy research. Okay, you've probably heard this one before. Start with yourself and work backwards from the known to the unknown, one generation at a time. And this is how you're gonna make sure that you're researching the right people. You don't wanna waste time researching somebody who turns out not to be your ancestor. Uh, when I got started in genealogy, I had this really weird urge to go far back in time and I wanted to find the oldest ancestor, but it was at the expense of accuracy. If you take the time to flush out as many details as you can for each generation, you're actually gonna make it easier to find the generation that came before them. Looking for information at home. This means taking a hard look at all those old boxes sitting around the house, uh, piles of papers, photographs, or other family memorabilia. Maybe it's jewelry inscribed with a marriage date or a quilt embroidered with birth dates and talk to family members. What materials do they have and what stories do they have? So this is your information gathering process and you really wanna review all these treasures that you find because it can be really easy to overlook some important information. And we wanna research the entire family, not just the direct ancestors. If we get too focused on that direct line, such as father to grandfather to great grandfather, without looking at the other family members, like siblings and aunts and uncles and cousins, we're gonna miss out on some really good information. It's not just gonna be the records of your grandfather that's gonna tell you about his life and his parents' life. It's also gonna be the records of his siblings and other relatives that will also tell you about his life and his parents' life. For example, uh, your grandfather's death certificate. You might be hoping to see your, his mother's maiden name, but it's not on there. Well, you could try looking for the death certificate of his sister, which might have that information. You can decipher handwriting by looking at multiple records and remembering formats. Well, pretty much all the records we're going to look at follow very similar formats. 
And you'll see the same phrases in baptism records and the same phrases in marriage records, like casse y vele en fascia ecclesia a, I marry and bless in front of the church, followed by the names of the groom and the bride. So you'll quickly learn to pick out that key information in a record. Um, and when it comes to handwriting, we might have to take a little bit of time to get familiar with how that person wrote. Now, ideally, when we find a record about our ancestor, we want to be able to understand it right away. But sometimes that handwriting is too tricky. So we look at the other records around it. How did this person write their R's? How did they write their S's? So it might be in these other records that you're able to make out a word you can't make out in your ancestor's record. That's kind of one way to figure out handwriting. And one of the best tools I've come, um, uh, I've learned about um, for handwritten genealogical records is called the BYU script. And I'll get further into that later. And then lastly, be alert for descriptive words following names. There are many possible descriptive words that could follow a name. They could refer to a person's ethnic background, Espanol, Mestizo, uh, Mulato, Indio. They could refer to a person's marital status, Casado, married, Soltero, single, Viudo, widowed. You might even see the words Difunto or Vivo, which means deceased or alive. Because like marriage records would typically name parents and then say if the parents were alive or deceased. So pay close attention to words following a name because they're probably giving important information. Um, when I got started doing genealogy, I had my ancestry.com trial subscription and I was plugging away names in those search boxes and looking at the search results. Well, it worked pretty well for my mom's side of the family who were farmers in the Midwest. I had some idea of where they were from. Uh, but when I got to my father's side of the family, I wanted to research his mother, my grandmother. I knew her name and her birth year. I knew her parents' names, but I didn't know what to put in the box for place. I just, I had no idea. So I put in Mexico and I got over 400,000 results. So knowing the country is really not enough. You need to know that town name. Um, and a lot of times we're gonna find that information in records created in the United States. So let's take a look at a few. Uh, this is my father's naturalization petition and it gives his place of birth as Guadalajara. So now at least I have a more specific location than Mexico for his mother. At least I know that on this date, she was in Guadalajara giving birth. So I could look for a birth record and perhaps it might mention where she's from. Marriage records. Uh, this is actually a copy of my grandparents' marriage that my father got by writing to the church back in 1990. Remember earlier, we talked about gathering material at home first, you know, gather what you have and get organized. So for my research, this is a really important paper to find at home. Uh, it shows that his parents were married in La Palma, Michoacan on December 30th, 1935. Uh, a lot of times a couple would marry in the bride's hometown. But in this case, it was actually the groom's hometown, and I found his baptism records in this location. Death certificates can provide place of origin. Uh, the information on them is usually provided by someone close to the deceased, such as a spouse or child. But if they're not available, it could be a son-in-law or even a neighbor. Well, as genealogists, we're hoping to find out date of birth, place of birth, parents' names. But if the informant didn't know that information, it's not going to be on the death certificate. So the death certificate on the right is from my grandmother. And the birthplace is listed as Mexico. Well, the informant was her second husband. Uh, either he didn't know it or he said it. And the person filling in the form for him decided to just write Mexico. I will never know. But the death certificate on the left does show a birthplace for Pauline Nemo. It shows that she was born in Frickenhausen, Germany and that her father's name was Isaac Konsleiter. And it was with those two nuggets of information, I could pick up the family line in Germany. Border crossing records can be great sources for town of origin. Uh, here we see the place of birth for my step-grandfather as Monclova, Coahuila, Mexico. This is a really great record. Uh, it also gives the name of his mother, Anastasia Perez. And it tells me she is the widow of Oria, Viuda de Oria. 
So when this record was created, her husband was already deceased. When I first learned about border crossing records, I wasn't really that interested in them for my own personal research. Uh, just because the family story was the family crossed the river and they didn't fill out any paperwork. So I was not expecting to find family in these records. But one thing that I've learned is that, you know, attitudes about the borders change. Uh, attitudes about immigration change over the year. There's a lot of back and forth movement. So I was very happy um, to find this record from 1937. This was well before my step-grandfather even met my grandmother. And it says that he was a salesman coming into the US for shopping. I did list some other possible records in the handout um, that could give place of origin. I was trying to post it in the chat, but I couldn't quite figure it out in time. But um, I'm going to give you my email address at the end of this presentation. and Just give me um, an email and I'll, I'll send it to you if that's what we need to do. All right, well, once you get that place of origin, you want to learn a little bit about it, right? You want to know where it is exactly. But it's also good to know about its jurisdictions and surrounding communities. One really great source for that is a geographical dictionary written by Antonio Garcia Cubas. And this was a five volume set published in the 1890s. And it's available on a lot of different websites since it's out of copyright. And there's one link to it uh, in your handout. It's really important to know about jurisdictional levels, because if you look for records for your town and you can't find any, where do you look next? So here's an entry for the town of Cojubatlan. The first sentence tells me it's part of the municipality of Sahuayo. So Sahuayo would be the next place I would look for records of Cojumatlan. Uh, gives me more detail about where it's located and crops that were grown there. And then it mentions there's a hacienda actually in the same area by the same name uh, that has 20 residents. So I did find many generations of ancestors living in Cojumatlan, but at some point the records stopped and I had to go within Sahuayo's records to continue finding records about my ancestors. Before a church was built in Cohumatlan, people went to the church in Sahuayo. So at some point you might have to go from your village church to a nearby older church. You can also use geographical guides written by Peter Gerhard. These books are typically found in like academic libraries and they're really good references for colonial geography. So if you want to really get into the geography and learn more about um, geographical changes, I would recommend these. Uh, the first one, the Guide to the Historical Geography of New Spain, uh, is more about the central Mexico area. The second one, the North Frontier of New Spain, of course, about um, more northern Mexico, the southwestern United States. And then the southeast frontier of New Spain is more about the Yucatan Peninsula. Okay, let's get into the records. Well, with Spain's colonization of the Americas came the Catholic Church. Catholicism was the only religion. Now, could you secretly practice another religion, like Judaism? Yes, you could, but there is a thing called the Inquisition to make sure you didn't. Um, there was a lot of pressure to participate in the church, so odds are you will find ancestors and Catholic church records. Uh, the most common ones probably are baptisms and marriages, but we can also find confirmation records, burial records, and church censuses. Now, these are beginning around the mid-1500s, a percentage of them probably have been you know, lost to time. There's been water damage, insect damage, war, um, but there's still a wealth of church records for us to explore. Civil registration records were created by the Mexican government and began in 1859. Now there was some distrust of this process and of the government, so it did take a few years for people to comply. So if you're looking for a civil registration birth record from 1860, you might not find it because it might not exist. It took people a while to comply with um, registering births, marriages, and deaths. Uh, the government also took federal censuses, and we'll talk about those in a little bit. Now, I do recommend looking for records from both the church and civil registration when possible. So if you have an ancestral couple who married in, let's say, 1880, look for that church marriage record and look for the civil registration marriage record and compare them because they're probably going to have different nuggets of information, or you can compare the information that they're providing. So let's take a look at the records. We're going to start off with baptisms. Uh, this baptism record is pretty easy to read. It's 
got a little bit of damage to the paper, but we can still make it out. So it's a printed form bound in a book that the priest would fill out. So we have standard phrases. We have the place, Kuhumatlan. We have the date, the 3rd of November, 1914. And the priest, Heliodoro Moreno. He is baptizing a baby girl, Una Infanta, who was born 30 days ago in Callejon, which is a tiny little village about three miles from Kuhumatlan. It says, I give her the name Maria, and she is the legitimate daughter, meaning her parents were married in the church of Abraham Torres and Julia Manzo. Sometimes baptism records will include the names of grandparents, but unfortunately not in this example. And then lastly, we have the names of the godparents or padrinos. And keep in mind that godparents are sometimes relatives. So pay attention to those. Now here's a handwritten baptism record of Maria's father, but it's pretty much written in the same format. So it's telling us the place, Bohumatlan. We get the date, 17th of March, 1879. And I, you know, I, I'm amazed at how they write out all these numbers. I would be so tempted to just write the numbers, but they actually wrote out the words, bless their hearts. Um, I, Ankel Zepeda, baptized, baptized an infant boy, four days old, born in Exquintla Ranch, and give him the name Jose Abraham de Jesus, the legitimate son of Luis Torres and Maria Marcela Mendoza. Now, the godparents are Crescencio Toro and Maria de la Trinidad Castellanos, who are married. Now, this record has notations in the margin. So at the top, it's got the baby's name and birthplace. But then there's a note written vertically, and it says that Abraham married Julia Manzo on January 31st, 1912. So you might see notes like this, but it really just seems to depend on the parish priests and how well, uh, you know, they kept up with these records, if they felt motivated to do that. One thing I noticed going through baptism records for the town of Bahumatlan is I would see clusters of a name. Uh, so in the example on the left, we have two different baby girls from two different parents, and they're both being baptized, Maria Gregoria, on March 12th. St. Gregory's feast day was on March 12th, at least until 1969, when the Second Vatican Council moved his feast day to September 3rd, so it didn't fall during Lent. Now, an example on the right, this is a boy being baptized on February 16th. He's three days old, meaning he was born on February 14th, St. Valentine's feast day, and he was given the name Jose Valentin. So one possible way for you to research your ancestor's birth date or date of baptism is to use their name and research saints' feast days. When I think of civil registration records, I think of really long handwritten records. Maybe that was just the area that I'm researching, um, but it's, you know, you can get through these. Again, they're gonna follow standard formats. So this one's starting off with the record number. It's record 116, and it's giving us the place and the date. So we're in Kohumatlan. It's August 9th, 1915 at 8 a.m. I love how the time is given. And then there's the name of the person who appeared at the civil registry to announce the birth of the child. So the date at the beginning of this record is not the birth date. It's the date the record was created. So here is Isabel Manriquez of the Rancho Rincón de María, she is telling the official that a baby boy was born on the 4th of August at 3 p.m. at home and given the name Jose Marriquez. It says he is an hijo natural, a natural son. So this means his parents have not married by civil registration. His parents, however, were married in a church ceremony. But as far as marriage goes, the church and civil registration did not recognize each other. So even though his parents were married in the church, the civil registration that didn't count unless they got married by civil registration. All right, confirmation records. Well, at first glance, this doesn't look very exciting. It looks like just a bunch of names, but you can confirm relationships between children and parents since they'll list um, the child's parents in addition to the child's name. Uh, you've got them in a specific place at a specific time. And you can also note the name of the god, uh, godparent and see if it's a name that pops up again. It could be a relative. And you also, you might be able to find more children in a given family, uh, the siblings of your direct ancestor. So in this confirmation record, I found both the children and their father getting confirmed. As confirmations were only performed by the bishop, how often these records appear depends on how often the bishop came to town. 
So in smaller towns, the bishop probably didn't come too often. Uh, so when he did, you would see people of many different ages getting confirmed. Now these records typically are not indexed, so they won't come up when you use those search boxes. But if you browse through a town's church records, they're usually nestled in with the baptism records. Let's zoom in at an example. So I found um, my direct ancestor, Abraham. There he is with his parents, Louise and Marcella. Well, here it's Marcelina. And he, I see he's got a brother who's also being confirmed, Maximiano, right? Same set of parents. But then also their father, Louise, is getting confirmed as well. And there's the name of his parents. And I can confirm that that is the correct Louise and not some other Louise, because in his um, marriage record to Marcelina Mendoza, his parents were listed. So that's how I know that's the correct Louise. So just in this one set of confirmation records, I've got three generations of family. So I thought that was pretty cool. So like baptisms, marriage records have a standard format. So we get the place, Bohumet Lan, we get the date, it's the 31st of January, 1912. The priest, Heliodoro Moreno, and the phrase you really want to look for, Casse y vele, en facia ecclesia a. So I married and blessed in front of the church. And then you'll see the names of the groom and the bride, Abraham Torres and Julia Manzo. So this, the actual record of this marriage ceremony is kind of paltry in genealogical information, especially when you compare it to the Información Matrimonial, which is a pre-marital investigation. Let's take a look at it. Before a marriage can take place, the church wants to investigate if both parties are cleared to get married. Are they closely related? If they are, they might need a dispensation. Has either party been married or engaged before? If so, what happened to the previous spouse? Has either party made a commitment to the church, such as joining the priesthood? These records are actually going to give you more information than the marriage record itself. And typically, they were recorded in separate books. So keep that in mind when looking for them. You'll get the names of the parents and whether they're deceased or alive. So we see for Abraham, both of his parents are deceased at the time of his marriage. Uh, it tells us Julia's parents are both alive. Um, it'll tell you where the bride and groom were born, their ages, where they're living now, oh, and how long they've been living. And this record will usually go on for several pages. You'll see witnesses giving testimony to knowing the bride and groom. And also the priest will record the readings of the amonestaciones or bands which were done on three consecutive holy days, usually Sundays. So the bans allowed time for members of the church to raise any claims of impediments to the marriage. Marriage dispensations often were for consanguinity, which is sharing a common ancestor. So a couple wanting to get married in the Catholic church who were related within the fourth degree of consanguinity, such as having a common great-great-grandparent, needed to have a marriage dispensation. And these records would usually include a family tree, which would show the connection between the bride and groom. So the common ancestor, the bride and groom here, is Francisco Salvador Buen Rostro y Esposa. So it's too bad they didn't name the wife. But they had a daughter, Felipa, and a son, Cayetano. They had children. Santiago and Maria Guadalupe were first cousins. They had children, Ramon and Juliana, they were second cousins. Juliana had a daughter, Maria Avalos. She is Ramon's second cousin once removed. So that shows you their connection. Um, if a marriage occurred after the implementation of civil registration, again, that's 1859, then you want to find the marriage record. Uh, unlike the church marriage record, this record is giving us the ages of Julia's parents. So that definitely made it worthwhile for me to find this record. You know, with that information, I can estimate when they may have gotten married. I can estimate when they may have been born. Burial records really vary widely on how much information they provide. It might be very basic, or you might get some good information. This one's pretty good. Uh, we have the deceased's name, Luis Torres, his age, he's 40, and he died in uh, Rancho de... Uh, oh, I wrote, okay, Rincón de María. His cause of death was wounds, and his marital status, he was a widower. Now, keep in mind that the date given here, May 30th, 1899, 
is the date of burial, which could possibly be his death date, but not necessarily. So just keep that in mind. And let's look for the civil registration death record. Same date, same place, same name, the age. He's five years older in this record. Um, he's still a resident of Rincón de Maria, but this record is giving us his parents' names, Jose Dolores Torres and Maria Jesus Santiago. And it tells me that they're alive at the time of this record. And also gives his deceased wife's name, Marcela Mendoza. And it tells us that Louise is originally from Rancho de la Calera. So definitely worthwhile to find both of those records. The only countrywide federal census available to us from Mexico is the 1930 census. Although there are some localities, including the federal district, uh, that are missing. But if you have family members in Mexico in 1930, look for them in the census. And if you've seen US federal censuses, it looks pretty similar, doesn't it, with the layout. And it's asking similar questions um, gender, age, marital status, occupation, and so forth. One thing that it's lacking is it does not tell you the relationships between the people in the household. So in this example, we have Abram Torres, Julia Manzo, and then a bunch of children. So it would be natural to assume that these are the parents and these are all those ki their kids, but we don't really know that for sure until we find records that prove that. So just keep that in mind when you find the census record. Uh, in this case, it is their children. I did find the baptism records. Well, here's a little trick you can do with the census, as you can estimate um, when the uh, mother and father were married. So you take the age of the oldest child, in this case, Luis Torres, he's 18. You subtract it from the mother's age, she's 34. Uh, and then you get 16. And she actually was 16 when she was married, so that worked out. And it's just a little trick you can sometimes use to estimate a marriage date. You can also find church censuses called padrones, and these were local parish censuses. Sometimes you'll find them mixed in with other church records. Uh, sometimes they're on their own, and usually they are not indexed. So again, they will not come up when you type names in search boxes. Now, most of these padrones are from the 1700s, but you'll also see them from uh, early 1800s, even 1600s. And the padrones are, uh, they're listing members of the church. And the concern is, is have these people complied with the Easter precept? The Easter precept says, you know, as a good Catholic, you should go to confession and communion at least once a year during the Easter season. So you might see notations on these that indicate if a person has done that. It could be the letter C. If you see two Cs, that means they um, confessed and went to communion. Uh, confiesan y comulgan. Uh, sometimes I've seen it marked with crosses too. What you find on these censuses really varies a lot. Uh, sometimes it's just a list of names in a parish. Other times more information is provided. So like in this one, the census taker divided up the households. So at least you can see who's living in a house. Sometimes they'll indicate ethnicity, um, social status, maybe even ages um, or occupation. It really does vary quite a bit. Uh, and this one, the first household, okay, usually the first houses listed are people of um, high ranking in the town, leaders, uh, those that are uh, highly educated. So this is the governor's house, uh, Luis Contreras, gobernador. Below him, Francisca Monica, su mujer. So this is kind of an old fashioned, old fashioned phrase for his wife. And then we have two more females, Josefa Augustina and Maria Augustina. And next to her name, it says para la doctrina. To me, this indicates that Maria Augustina is younger and that she's still learning the church sacraments of confession and communion. And then maybe she's not able to participate fully, but she's at the age where she's learning them. She's learning the church doctrine. So she could be anywhere from between like seven to 11, possibly. If you're interested in these church censuses, some of them are transcribed in books or periodical articles. You can also use uh, this book by Lyman Platt. It's called Census Records for Latin America and the Hispanic United States. And the way it works is you just look up your area. So I went to the Mexico section, I went to Michoacan, and I browsed the town names. 
So I looked for Kahumatlan and there was only one listing from 1668. So I was a little disappointed, but then I remembered a lot of times Kahumat Lan's records are in Sohuayo. So I looked up Sohuayo, which had several entries. So just keep in mind that your town could be under the umbrella of a larger town. And indeed, when I looked at the Padrones for Sohuayo, I did find Kahumat Lan within it. So the way this book works, you find your town, and in the far column, there's this number, or uh, information about an archive. If it's a number, that means it's the Family History Library microfilm number. What you do is you copy that number, you go to familysearch.org, go to the catalog, and plug in that number to pull up that padrón. So higher level stuff, um, I'll happy to explain it to you more if you're interested. Okay, there are other records than what we just talked about. Um, some of them are notarial records or protocolos. These are records that were recorded and verified by a notary. So public notaries and scribes in Latin America recorded a great variety of legal documents, you know, not more so than here in, Amer in the United States. Uh, these could be wills, guardianship records, dowry records, mortgages, the purchase and sale of goods or lands, and agreements or settlements. A very few Mexican notarial records have been microfilmed and they're more difficult for researchers to access. Um, a lot of times you're going to look to archives. It could be a local archive, state archive, or even a national archive. And that's part of the challenge is to find which archive the notary's papers went to. And it's similarly true for military records. Very few have been microfilmed and the records are typically found in archives. Could be in Mexico, could be in the US, or could even be in Spain from the colonial era. Uh, if this is something you're interested in, I included a few sources in the handout. Some archives do provide digital images of the material online. Uh, a few are the uh, Bear Archives, Nacogdoches Archives, and the Fondo Col Colonial. I have found Hispanic genealogical periodicals to be very helpful in my research and great for learning. So if you have access to any, whether it's at your local library or maybe through fellow researchers, I should check them out. You know, the past issues, they don't go out of date. Um, unless it's an article about computers, sometimes those go out of date. But this is people who go to an archive and they find records for a little town in Mexico and they index and transcribe all the marriages that took place there and they publish them in one of these periodicals. There's some um, family histories. There's how-to articles. They're great. Um, if I omitted any, I apologize. I just uh, wrote down some that I was familiar with. Okay, translation tips. Well, just remember most documents have a very typical format. You get to know these and your research will be easier. There are a couple of books by George Rice Camp, um, Finding Your Mexican Ancestors, a, beginning, a Beginner's Guide. That's a really good book to start with. And then he also wrote Tracing Your Hispanic Heritage, which gets more in depth. So if you wanna learn even more, that would be a good one to check out. And then there's also the BYU script tutorial, which hold on to your hats. I'm gonna to get to that in about a minute. Okay, sounding words out loud. Spelling in the past was inconsistent to say the least, and it was often done phonetically. Uh, you can almost expect spelling to be inconsistent. So if you see a word that looks really weird, try saying it out loud and you might recognize it that way. Um, for example, uh, the word indio was often spelled starting with a Y in the past. You know, nowadays we would spell it starting with an I. Or the name Ventura. It could start with a B or it could start with a V. Watch out for abbreviations. They're used a lot. Um, I imagine if you had to write everything out by hand, you would probably want to use abbreviations. Um, names, words, or even whole phrases could be abbreviated. And one tool you can use to figure out abbreviations is the BYU script tutorial. Let me go ahead and show you what it looks like. It's a free website created by Brigham Young University. It was a very strong genealogy program. And they created these tutorials for different languages. So this is the Spanish script tutorial. And over there on the left, you can see all the different um, documents and information that they provide. So there's um, a button for abbreviations. There's uh, lists of names. I find those very helpful when I can't make out all the letters in a name. I'll compare it to these name lists. You know, they also have really old fashioned names that you don't see anymore. Um, 
alphabet, you'll see samples of how different letters were written in the past, sample documents and exercises. It's a really great resource, so check it out if you haven't already. And then lastly, if you've tried all these techniques and you still can't make out a record, maybe it's the handwriting or maybe it just doesn't seem to make sense, try crowdsourcing it. You can ask fellow genealogical society members, fellow researchers, librarians, or Facebook groups. I do want to say if you're going to use Facebook, well, of course, anytime, you want to verify what somebody's telling you. And I just say that because I've seen some strange claims made on Facebook. Okay, we looked at BYU script tutorial already. Oh, here's some abbreviations. Okay, do you want to guess what MA stands for? It's very common. Maria. Okay, this one's a little bit harder. J-U-O. Juan. Okay, the last one's hardest. X-P-T-U-O-A-L. Cristobal. I almost never see Cristobal written out like that. I always see it starting with an X. You know, which is short for Christ. Okay, then I've got two samples for us to look at. Here's a name, Estanislaus Avalos, B-T-R-O, right? So his surname is being abbreviated. It's Buen Rostro, which was a very common name in the community he lived in. Okay, the example below, we see a list of padrinos. The padrinos circled in yellow, their name is Y-D-Y-D. -Y -D. No, this is an abbreviation. YD is short for idem. It's a Latin word, which means the same. So instead of writing quotation marks, that's what we would use today. Uh, this person wrote idem, idem. So it's repeating Rafael Maciel's name. Okay, I've shown you a lot of records and I'm sure by now you're wondering, how do I find these records? The good news is a lot of these records are available online. A family search and ancestry are the two biggest, and you can find church records, civil registration records, um, church censuses, and the 1930 federal census on them. Now, there are some tricks to using them beyond the search boxes. So let's start with family search. It's a free website. You create an account, and then you can view the records. Now, one way to use the website is to enter names in the search boxes, like you see on the left. You get your search results, you look at the search results, you decide if they're about your ancestor or not. The other way to use FamilySearch is to use their unindexed records. So FamilySearch is the creation of the Church of Latter-day Saints. And what they do is they send missionaries out around the world to microfilm or digitize vital records. And there is such a great quantity that they're not all indexed. Meaning you're not going to see these records when you type names into search boxes. Instead, you're going to find these unindexed records in the catalog, and you'll browse the images like you would an unindexed book. So let's take a look at an example. FamilySearch.org. I went to search and then catalog. So here's the catalog page. I encourage you to explore it. One way is to enter the town you're researching. So I entered Kahumatlan. Hit search, and it showed me what they have for Kahumatlan. This isn't even all of it. This is just what I could show you in one screenshot. So on the left, it's telling you the record type and the years. On the far right, you'll see either a camera icon or a magnifying glass icon. If it's the camera, that means that those images are digitized and you can view them on the website. If you see the magnifying glass, that means at least some of those records have been indexed and they will come up when you use the search boxes. But look, there's only four magnifying glasses here on this page. The majority of these records are not indexed. So let's take a look at the first one. Baptismos, or baptisms, 1823 to 1857. It's got the camera icon. I click on the camera icon, and here's the images of baptisms for those years. So don't panic. You don't have to look at every single image, especially since we know the date range. And if you have an idea of the when your when your record was created let's say 1850 then you know it's going to be towards the back of these images probably a lot of times these records were uh, organized chronologically not always um, but you can jump around you can click on different images to pull to open them up uh, sometimes there's little wayfinders that will give you some clue as to where within the 600 records you'll find your record <laughs> 
I did want to show you one more thing about the Family Search catalog page. Earlier, we were talking about church censuses, and I recommended using Lyman Platt's book and that it would give you a microfilm number. This is where you're going to plug in that microfilm number. Below Kahumat Lawn, you'll see in blue letters where it says film slash fiche number. You would click on that and enter that film number, and that's how you're going to find the church census. Go back forward. Okay. Ancestry.com does not have unindexed records, as far as I'm aware. But a cool trick for using Ancestry beyond the search boxes is to use a catalog and to get into the specific collection of the record you're looking for. So if you're looking for a civil registration birth record for Micho Khan, don't use the search boxes on the home page. Go to the catalog, and you're going to use the filters on the left. Uh, you can't see them all in this image, but you can filter by place, um, time period, category. And so what I did is I filtered for Mexico and I selected Michoacan. So now they're showing me their collections that match those parameters. Up near the top, I can see Michoacan, civil registration births. So I would click on it and then I'm just going to be searching within that one collection. And I'm not dealing with everything else that Ancestry has on their website. So it's a really focused search. I do recommend using it. Another thing that's nice about Ancestry is if you were to scroll down the page below all these search boxes, you'll see what's on the right. It's a description of the collection. You'll find some good information here. You know, it's starting off telling us civil registration in Mexico began in 1859, although compliance wasn't enforced until 1867. And it goes on. This information is great. Sometimes it'll tell you uh, why you're not finding certain records, maybe, you know, one year the records burned in a fire, or it could tell you how to get an official copy. Sometimes it'll tell you who to contact. Very helpful information. Okay, as we wrap this up, we talked about a lot, but just remember, utilize the research strategies. You're going to work from the known to the unknown, no jumping over generations. You can keep a sharp eye out for information at home and have a willing ear for the family stories. Research the entire family and you will reap the benefits and look for descriptive words following names. We're going to identify a place of origin by looking at records created in the United States. And then we'll look up these towns in Garcia Cubas's Geographical Dictionary or Peter Gerhard's uh, Geographical Guides. We'll search for church records and civil registration records. And we'll get through these documents by remembering most of them are written in standard formats and we can use tools like the BYU script tutorial or the books by George Ricekamp to figure out uh, words and phrases we're not familiar with. And lastly, we'll improve our online research by using the catalogs of ancestry and family search. And with that, we'll be well on our way to researching our Mexican ancestry. Thank you for joining me today. That's great, Joy. Um... We are taking questions in the chat box. So anyone who is here who'd like to do a follow-up question would be great. Um, I always enjoy hearing you, Joy, because there is so much to know. There's so many resources out there. And for those who weren't in the main room, that's where her, her handout is. So just circle back over to the main room and, and go to the chat box for the handout. Excuse me, Joy, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hi, Joy. Hi. Uh, I'm quite a novice at this. My brother-in-law is the one that did all the research for us in the United States. However, I know my father-in-law was born in Mexico, and I'm. A, they tell me Zacatecas. However, I have absolutely nothing, and all everybody's gone now. Mm. He, my brother-in-law's gone, my mother, my father, everybody as far as that uh, side of my family where do I even begin? I mean, I, I took all these notes that you just, you know, had, but where's, where should I be with my starting point? I start with him, my husband and his father, and he came over when he was a small child. I have no idea. Sure. Um, the, the ancestor that came from Zacatecas, I would try to do an exhaustive search of every record you could possibly find on him. <laughs> oh, and, do you know what time period he lived? Uh, he, yes, he uh, lived in the, my father-in-law actually lived, he passed away about 30 years ago, 
but he came over as a, as a small child, as probably eight years old or 12. And his name is different. Everything was under a B like boy. And we all concluded, my brother-in-law who did the you know research, uh, V as in Victor. And I noticed that was a common uh, transition at the beginning. So we're assuming it's V like Victor. Yeah, that can be a challenge. Um, I know like my father and his family, sometimes there's Aureus, sometimes he has Perez, sometimes he has Torres. Um, did you, were you able to find them in any border crossing records? No, I, I haven't. As I said, okay. I completely, we were getting into it and my brother-in-law passed away. So okay. we, you know, we didn't go any further than that. Maybe uh, social security records sometimes give birthplace. Oh, that's a thought. I know and there's did work. Yeah, there's some available on Ancestry. I can't remember exactly what year they go up to. Um, but if it's more recent, you can request a copy as family. This might be a possibility. Or military records, if you served in the military. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and as far as try, starting, let's say, with us, with his uh, Social Security and, or work records, uh, I would just have to go to the company he worked for and try to start at that point? No, Social Security records, I'm, I'm pretty sure, are available on Ancestry. Uh, I'm just not sure what year up to they're available. But, you know, Ancestry, what it does is um, below the collection, it'll tell you how to obtain a copy. I think it's called the, um, the SS5. I, or S, I don't know it off the top of my head, but you can request a copy as a family member of his um, social security records, which usually give birthplace. Um, you could also try, let me think, uh, sometimes church records in the US mention birthplace or maybe pension records, depending okay. on what industry he was in, um, passport applications. Okay. Okay. That's a thought because they, he did marry here in the States, of course, you know, so they did marry in the church. So go back to that. Yeah. Yeah. The church record of his marriage here in the U S might tell his birthplace. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. That's a good start. Okay. Uh, Thank and, you know, you. Yeah. There's, there's some, um, some digitized newspapers, you know, sometimes, sometimes in marriage announcements, they would say where the bride and groom were from or in obituaries, or I, I suppose, you know, if you've done DNA, you could see, you know, who's matching up with him and where, where are these people from? You know, where, what towns are recurring in their family trees? But, you know, I know that would be hard to do, but it's a possibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, my husband's done DNA and so has my son. And that's basically who I'm trying to get some of this information for my son. You know, I, I, I mean, I have my information for my side of the family, but I'd like to get that for my son. He's the only one I have left. Mm. So. Yeah, sure. Lydia was mentioning uh, naturalization records. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like my dad's naturalization petition, I found it on Ancestry, so that was pretty easy. Um, so that would be the you know. Ancestry. And then oh, I think, right. um, you yeah, know, I'm not sure now which government agency you could request them from. Uh, is it C? Does anybody know that off the top of their head? <laughs> I would think it was a national art. Archive. Well, I think if it's older, you might be able to find it in the National Archives record, but if it's more recent, oh. um, it might be a matter of requesting it from the government agency. I would say that it used to be INS, but I'm not sure what it's called now. But yeah, National Archives is a possibility, definitely. Okay. All right. Well, you've given me some good uh, starting points. Okay. I appreciate that very much. Thank sure. you. Uh -huh. I enjoyed your presentation. Well, thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Okay, we're at the 1050 mark. Do we have any other questions? Well, folks, boy, we, I guess we will just see you at the other conference programs. And uh, again, we appreciate Joy's uh, presentation and it was really always interesting. So thank you very much. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. I'm gonna end the uh, session now if I hear no other questions. Going once. <laughs> okay, thank you again. See you. Bye-bye.